Um, we had another tragedy this week with the shooting, I don't even know how you say the word, Umpqua? Yeah, that's yes. Umpqua. That place. The, the only thing I knew about it before this week is their ice cream was always on sale. That's all I knew about that place. Okay? And I want to share with you some thoughts I had about this. Okay? So the first thing, I'm going to lay some ground rules for where I'm coming from. This was apolitical. So drop your politics right now. Okay? This was not about being a Republican or a Democrat or a Libertarian or a Constitutionalist or an Independent. This was evil. Okay? So, set aside what you think about what should be done, and let's focus on what was done. Okay? God is not an affiliate of your political party. He supersedes it. Okay? So, lay that down for just a minute. You guys can pick it up and discuss later. Uh, quite honestly, I'm disgusted with how an event like this can evolve so quickly into something so trivial as whether or not we should have guns. Okay? Now, don't get me wrong. I own several guns. I like them. I think this country was founded on the right to have them. So don't, don't get me wrong, I'm not attacking the Second Amendment. What I'm saying is there is a much larger issue happening here than whether or not we should have guns. Okay? So the fact that um, this man came in and perpetrated an assault on this college campus this, this was an attack against Christianity. Every bit as much as that attack in Charleston. Every bit. Okay? We have witnesses that have reported. He questioned people, are you a Christian? They said yes, they were shot in the head. If they said no or did not respond, he shot him in the leg. That's an attack on Christianity. That's an attack, an assault on the body of Christ. And we should be grieving for those who gave their life for his namesake. Okay? We talk about what goes on over in Iran. We talk about what goes on over in North Korea. We talk about what goes on in those other places. That happened here, folks. That happened here. People were targeted because of what they believe. But I want to ask you, do you feel the same sense of horror for the non-believers? For those who went into eternity never having again the chance to be redeemed. Does your heart grieve as God's does for them? Because God is not grieving for the Christians. God's rejoicing with them. They are before the throne right now. <clears throat> but those others... They will never know communion with the Father. Never. Are we more upset about the attack on our faith system than we are on the loss of those that were not reached by our faith system?
See, we've got our priorities wrong. We tend to have an elitist view of who we are. We've arrived. We're the chosen. We're special. Christ went to the cross for everyone. He went to the cross for me, for you, for the unbelievers that died in the shooting, for the shooter, for ISIS, for Boko Haram, for the godless communist regimes that are persecuting his church. He went to the cross for all of them. And before we came to the cross and received his blood, we were bound for the same destination that they are. A couple issues that I want to address this morning. First, We are called to persecution. As a follower of Christ, you are called to a life of persecution. Not comfort, not riches, persecution. Jesus in speaking in John chapter 15, he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Okay? So the, the, the founding principle that we see here is the world hated Jesus, <coughs> the world persecuted Jesus. As a follower of Jesus, as a Christian, a little Christ, a Christ imitator, they should hate us, and persecute us. Okay? 1 Peter, chapter 4, says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. Boy, that describes me. Stuff comes on me and I go, what is this? But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering. That you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you're insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. You catch that statement? I'm going to read this again. Listen to what Peter is saying. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed. Because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God, and if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? 
Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. <coughs> I want to read that last line again. Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. <clears throat> See, both Paul and Peter, there's no question. You're going to suffer. Matter of fact, Seems pretty plain to me that it's God's will that you would do so. <clears throat> Paul says that I want to know him not only in the glory of his resurrection, but also in the fellowship of his suffering. That I might somehow attain the resurrection. See, it's a competition. It's a mad race in your life, in your mind, as to who will rule your life. Is God going to have his say? And you will obediently follow him? Or will you dictate what you do with your life? See, the price is paid. The price for your life has been paid. And when you come to him, you change from a slave of sin to becoming a love slave, a bond servant of Christ. You can't come just as Accepting him as Savior. You come accepting him as Lord. And that means he gets to choose what you do and what you don't. He's the boss. If you have your Bibles, open with me to 2 uh, Timothy chapter 3. Start in verse 1. But understand this. You paying attention? Yes. Understand this. Get this in your brain. Comprehend it. That in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. Why? For people will be lovers of self. Don't have to look very far to see that, do you? Lovers of money. Proud. Arrogant. Abusive. Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. See, see what he's describing here <clears throat> is not the world. It's the church. The world does not have an appearance of godliness. 
the world outright rejects godliness. He's not describing the world at the end times. He's that would be the description of the world all the time. He's describing the church, those that have come into the body, those that have insinuated themselves in. The hypocrites, the mask wearers, those that have the appearance of godliness, but they have no power. These are the wolves in sheep's clothing that come into the body and seek to do the will of their master who is not God, but the devil. He has a very simple directive to us. Avoid them. Don't, don't have anything to do with them. See, hold this up in light of Paul's other writings. When does he tell us not to have anything to do with those types of people? It's always in the course of talking about those in the body. As a matter of fact, in another book, he says, I'm not talking about the world because if I were talking about the world, you'd have to separate yourself from everyone. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in minds and disqualified regarding the faith. But they will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all of us. As, what, as was that of those two men. You, however, okay, drawing our attention back. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra which persecutions I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Now, now, just kind of back up a little bit to give you a little history here. Paul just listed the churches that he stopped at on his first missionary journey, the, the cities. And in each of those cities he established a church. And he started off in Antioch. We go back to Acts 13, 14. And he went to the synagogue. He and Barnabas went to the synagogue and they, they told the news that was going on. The Messiah had come. <coughs> and the Jews were excited. They invited them back the next week. Come back next week and tell us more. And the word got out. And the next week they come to synagogue and all the Gentiles show up because they want to hear this miraculous news. And the Jews are offended. Whoa! 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 These people didn't show up when it was just us. And they started arguing vociferously against Paul and Barnabas. And they didn't settle just with debate, but they went to the leaders in the city. And they had people rise up and they chased them out of the city. They go to Iconium. Remember Iconium, where they wanted to make them a, a sacrifice to Zeus and Hermes? You, you remember Iconium, where they stoned Paul, such that they thought he was dead? Sometime when you want to discuss some trivia, I have some thoughts about what happened there. Come talk to me. Paul gets up. Now, I, I don't know about you guys, but... If, People have been heaving rocks at my head and finally quit because they thought I was dead and I, I, I stood back up. I wouldn't be going back in the city. I'd be going the other direction. But Paul goes back into the city. And then they leave. They go over to Lystra. So looking in those chapters, we see that in every place that Paul and Barnabas went, the, the Jews came and they, they incited the people against them. And they had horrific 
persecutions. So he's not talking about, oh, they just disagreed with me in the synagogue. Okay? And he's reminding Timothy, you, you've been here, you've seen this. And he says, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. He still got hit with the rocks, folks. And God rescued him. Indeed, verse 12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, <clears throat> continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Now I'm going to take a little segue here for just a moment. Okay? Verse 15, Paul addresses an issue that we are struggling with in this church. Okay? Verse 15, he says, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every week I stand up here and I plead for Sunday school teachers. These, these three young men that came up and served communion, I've had the pleasure of watching them grow up and, and watching them become the young men of God that they are and seeing God work in their lives, seeing the incredible transformation that takes place from not knowing God, not being known by God, to being His. I got to teach some of them in Sunday school. Sunday school is not time for babysitting. I'm not asking you to babysit. I'm asking you to invest. I am asking you to invest in their lives for this reason. You have been acquainted with the sacred writings, the Bible. Why? Because they're able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> See, that's, that's the end result of Sunday school. Wisdom. Wise unto salvation through Christ Jesus. And once they're there, to build them up that they can stand firm. That they will be unshakable before a world that hates them. That they will stand firmly planted in the power of his might and proclaim his name. We need teachers who are willing to invest in this generation. I've seen all the statistics, and you've heard them before. Between 70 and 90% of kids, as soon as they leave home, leave the church. Only about 30% of them, give or take, come back. That's telling me that there's something wrong in the church. That that generation is not being reached. We put programs in place to titillate and entertain them, to keep them out of our hair so we can do grown-up things. And yet, what faith 
do we need to be saved? That of a child. That of a child. I don't think Jesus was speaking allegorically. I think he was saying it's that simple. You have got to have absolute trust. When my kids were little, um, I used to love swimming. I was, a, I was a good swimmer. And Christy doesn't like water mostly at all. And so uh, when we went to the pool, it was a big deal. And um, I remember very clearly taking Christopher and Benjamin <clears throat> to the pool. And, you know, you do the game where you'd stand them on the side and they'd jump into your arms. And sometimes you'd catch them and sometimes you wouldn't. And <laughs> <laughs> Will you play it your way? I'll play it mine. <laughs> I, Christopher was very easy because Christopher wanted to make sure everything was in place and everything was ready so I would catch him. Donovan did not care. <laughs> Donovan, it was the sheer joy of running and jumping and hitting the water. And I'll tell you what, Christopher was a big boy. And they were, I took two hands to keep him up out of the water. And I'm trying to grab his flailing body up out of the water and here goes Donovan. Whoop! <laughs> <laughs> Donovan had implicit faith that dad was not going to let him struggle. <clears throat> that dad was going to pull him back, back up out of the water. That was the faith of a child. That's the faith that God is asking us. Get to the edge and don't pause and look and wait. Trust me. Jump. See, we've got to do something different with this generation than we have been doing. We've got to reach them at this point in their lives. We've got to saturate them so much with the Word of God that when they get out of our house, and the devil comes against them, they have tools with which to fight. And I'll tell you one thing further. It doesn't end there. And it doesn't begin there. This is just like reaffirmation of everything that they should be learning at home. When we stand before God, he's not going to pull up the Sunday school teacher and chastise them for the behavior or salvation or lack thereof of your child. He's going to hold you responsible and you accountable. Okay? So, end of segue. Back to where we were. <coughs> you desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, you will be persecuted. <clears throat> I have a, a simple question for you. Usually we hear this passage of scripture in a different direction, but I'm, I'm going to lay this out for you. If you are not being persecuted, is it simply because they don't know? Do they have reason to believe that you are of them and not of Christ? Do they have reason <coughs> to persecute you? Have you ever put before them that you're different? That you are not the same as them. <coughs> Romans chapter 10. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 13. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 13. 
Romans 10, verse 13. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? So, understand, everyone means everyone. But it's predicated on what follows. It doesn't just say everyone will be saved. You see that? It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay? How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. <clears throat> but they have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, I'm going to back up because there's a very simple process that Paul is working his way through here. It says, first they've got to call on him. Well, no, actually that's, that's last. They've, they've got to believe before they can call on him. But, but they can't believe unless they hear. And, and they'll never hear unless someone preaches. And And They'll never be preached to unless they're sent to preach. Paul is not talking about me as the pastor of this church here. Do you understand that? It's very easy to look at this and go, oh, good, Glenn's job. not what he's talking about. He's talking about the Great Commission. Now, you know, I, I went to Bible school and I learned how to preach. I don't preach like I learned. Okay? I, I simply put, I, I have friends that are preachers, and boy, I can tell you by their Facebook posts where they are at in the process of writing their sermon. And they are some godly men. And I believe they are hearing and doing of God. But I don't believe that there is a method to preaching the word. Because as hard as I've studied, and as many professors as I've questioned, I cannot find in scripture the three-point message. <laughs> I can't find it. I want you to close your eyes for a minute because I'm going to wrap up here. Now I want you looking around. I don't want any peer pressure right here. I want an open heart before God. <clears throat> the reverse of the process is they have to call on Him because they believe in Him, because they heard about Him, because somebody preached about him, because they were sent. I am putting to you right now, each and every one, I am sending you. And direct response to this word, I am sending each of you to be a, an ambassador a representative of Christ, a light in the darkness. I am challenging you to be what God has called you to be, His representative, His spokesperson.
It's time we suffered some persecution because we are not taking another step back. We are not accommodating the world any longer. We are not seeking peace with them. Peace gives them an easy road straight into hell. We want to make it as difficult as we possibly can for them to get into hell. By the call of the Father, by his word, I am sending you into the world. Father, I ask that you would take your word, Father, that it would find good soil, healthy, vibrant, living, life-giving soil. That, Father, in each of us, your fruit would be produced, reproduced, and multiplied. Father God, that you would make of this body, this fellowship, a hand that would reach out into the world. That our drive and our passion would be to seek the lost and to show the light to bring the gospel, this message of peace that has saved us to them. <clears throat> God, that we would be driven because the time is short. There is no guarantee for anyone tomorrow. And thousands are perishing every day in eternity. Father, we are asking that workers would be sent out into the harvest. And I'm asking, Father, that you would send us out into the harvest, that we would be faithful harvesters. God, that we would encourage one another. That we would be the strength for one another. That we would pray for one another. God, that we would be your witnesses, faithful and true. Father, I ask that you would bless the work of our hands, the work of our lives, that they might in turn bless you. We thank you, Father, for your loving kindness to us. <clears throat> 